Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and this is the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them, and we always start with the pick of the week. But before we do that, Let's address the elephant in the room. This is going to be the last weekly comic book review for the foreseeable future. I started doing these back in October of 2016. I have not missed a week yet, so it really sucks that I won't be able to do it next week, and that's because Diamond Comics has stopped distributing new print comics to comic shops. So this is the last new comic book day you're going to get. A lot of shops are already closed up and have been closed up due to like forced uh, closures and things like that of non-essential businesses, and I understand all that. Um, and it's, it's just crazy, and it sucks. I don't know what's going on with the digital world. Maybe they're still going to release them digitally. Probably not. I don't think that would be the wisest decision. Um, so, I don't know. There's just going to be no new comic books for a while. So, I still feel like the streak is not quite ending, because as soon as there are new comic books, I'm going to come back with a weekly comic book review. And, just because there's no weekly comic book review for the foreseeable future... Doesn't mean we're stopping here at Pop Culture Philosophers like we have been for the last week. We're going to continue doing live streams and continue creating content for your viewing pleasure. So let's get right into the video. I savored each and every single one of these comic books. And this week's Pick of the Week, Once in Future, number seven from Boom Studios. Could it be anything else? Well, it could because there's a lot of great books out this week. Karen Gillan, Dan Moore, and Tamara Bond Villain. Once in Future is amazing. This is the second story arc. The first trade paperback is actually out today as well. So if you missed out on Once in Future, grab up the trade, hop on issue number seven. This book is fire. This really launches into the second arc with intense momentum, a fast pace, faster than the first issue of the first arc because there was a lot of setup to do. It's just going right into it. Dan Mora, Tamara Bonvillain, what a knockout team on the art. The crisp, clear, dynamic line work of Mora paired with the the amazing contrast and brilliant color palette in Tamara Bond Villain's hand. She is a master at the craft of comic book coloring. Once in Future is just one of the best out there. The way that Gillen can take a Thorian legend and kind of twist it around and make something truly adventurous and also truly terrifying all at the same time. I love this book so much. The artwork, the colors, Oh my goodness, it's amazing. The first trade paperback's out today, and so is the first issue of this second story arc. I cannot wait for more Once in Future, and we're just gonna have to wait for just a little bit. So that kind of sucks. It sucks to, like, kick off a new book and then, like, well, it'll, it'll continue when it continues. Anyway, Once in Future, number seven from Boom Studios, my pick of the week. Let's continue on with a couple more Boom books. Folklords number five is here. This is the final issue for now, because it definitely leads itself very open to return, and I really hope it does. Matt Kent, Matt Smith, and Chris O'Halloran have done a great job with this book. This book has been steeped in mystery, and it's been slowly unraveling as the issues progress, but it's about a kid who lives in this, like, fantasy fairy tale type world, and he dreams of our, our like, modernized, technological-based world, right? And there's some kind of mystery there, and he's trying to find the enigmatic um, folk lords who will um, possibly reveal the mystery to him. Well, a lot of mystery is revealed in Folklore's number five. It's not quite the direction I thought it was going to go in, but it was in the same ballpark. Uh, you could kind of pick up on it as it was progressing, but the way it sets up things and the ending of this, really cool. Really liked it. Matt Smith and Chris O'Halloran do a great job with the artwork. It's Magnola S in terms of its composition and its pacing. Um, the coloring is absolutely spot on. It's brilliant and it's amazing and it's supremely effective. Matt Kent's done a really, really good job with this one, and he's just really doing some solid work right now, including his new book, Bang, over at Dark Horse, in which there's a lot of uh, subtle, um, I would say subtle um, advertisements for Bang in this issue. If you read it, you know what I'm talking about. Folklore's number five concludes its initial arc. Let's hope it comes back and comes back soon. It definitely seems like that's the plan, so I'm excited for that. Also, we got Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 49 with the foil cover we've been waiting for. That's right, the Green Ranger foil cover. Super excited to get this one before the big issue 50, whenever that's going to drop now. This Necessary Evil story by Ryan Parrott has absolutely been fantastic. I enjoyed it. I've enjoyed this more than Shattered Grid, and I love Shattered Grid. In fact, this Power Ranger book is one of the best superhero comics on shelves, along with its sister book, Go Go Power Rangers, telling one great story across two 
closely related but separate eras of Power Ranger lore. Really liking it. Great stuff. Dynamic artwork. The coloring in this one seems a little bit more just kind of out of place. It doesn't feel as vibrant as it has. I don't know if, if they switch colors. I didn't really notice it, but the artwork, the line work, still cool. Starts feeling a little bit rushed, but you can definitely tell that they've been going at this pace for a while now. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, like I said, this book has been fire. Cannot wait to see what happens in the game-changing issue number 50. And that is the foil cover I've been waiting for. Let's jump over to Marvel Comics. We got a launch of a new X book. It's called Hellions. Number one, I was not really looking forward to this one. It's a ragtag group of misfit mutants and kind of semi C list, D list villains. And I don't know, you got Havoc and Psylocke, and that's cool. It's not Psylocke, right? I mean, it is Psylocke. She's called Psylocke because the other Psylocke is Captain Britain. Anyway. Um, and Mr. Sinister, right? Mr. Sinister's never really been my favorite, but I really like this Hickman era Mr. Sinister. I'm finding him to be very fun. Um, so I wasn't really looking forward to this, and I'm sure most people aren't, because Hellion's like, okay, big deal, right? It's written by Zeb Wells. Um, Sokovia is the artist. What is the first name of that artist? What I will say is this. Um, I loved this book. I thought it was amazing. Steven Sokovia. I thought the art was great. I thought it was really cool and sleek. The coloring was awesome. And I really liked these characters in this situation. It's basically, it's the problem children for, for Krakoa. The mutants that won't quite fit in, like Orphan Maker and Nanny and Empath and whoever that dude is from the Marauders back in the day. And of course, Wild Child. And then you got Havoc and you got Psylocke in there as well. Um, so basically, for some reason, some mad reason, the Quiet Council on Krakoa goes, you know what, we don't know what to do with these people, so what better idea than to just give them to Mr. Sinister and let Mr. Sinister form a team with them? What? It's really good. I liked it. I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting. I thought the usage of the characters and the setup of the story was really cool, and I really liked the artwork. I liked the inclusion of Psylocke and Havoc in the book, and it got me a little bit more interested in wanting to go back and read more of the Orphan Maker Nanny stuff, because I have no idea who they are. Anyway, Hellions number one really surprised me. I thought this was very, very solid. If you're next fan, you're not going to have any new Xbox for a while. Might as well try Hellions, number one, out this week. And a new giant size is out this week, a one-shot Nightcrawler. So Nightcrawlers. So originally it was going to be Magneto. Magneto dropped back in the schedule. Who knows when that's coming out now. Um, but the Nightcrawler jumped ahead of it. It's got artwork by Alan Davis. It's written by Jonathan Hickman. It doesn't feel quite as essential as the Jean Grey Emma Frost one did, but it does set up some things that could blossom further. And definitely, you know Hickman, everything that he's writing right now in the X-Men has a purpose, right? But this is a cool, fun book. It's Nightcrawler um, and a few other mutants like Magic and uh, 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 Cypher um, and a few others. They go to the X-Mansion. We haven't seen the X-Mansion since Krakoa and it's kind of overgrown um, and it's got an infestation and possibly a haunting going on there. So it's Nightcrawler and them trying to figure that out. And it's got something that's neat because it kind of ties into some old school X-Men stuff. And that's something that Hickman's been doing very well with this book is doing something completely new and bold and different, but still pulling from X-Men stories, great X-Men stories before, from great runs like Chris Claremont and Grant Morrison. Giant Size X-Men Nightcrawler, really liked this one, thought it was good. The Alan Davis artwork really kind of takes you back. It's a little bit more rough and raw feeling than his classic Excalibur, but it will definitely give you some classic Excalibur vibes, and I really feel like the, the more gritty, um, uh, nature of the line worker. I don't know what exactly it is, but something's just a little bit more textured than normally in Alan Davis. It really works with the the tone and atmosphere of the story. Anyway, really did like that one. We got a few X-Men books. X-Men number nine. This was a great issue that sets up a whole new game-changing status quo for the Brood. Um, so this had been the rare two-issue story um, in Jonathan Hickman's run. Each issue, for the most part, has been a one-and-done story. This one continues over from issue number eight, um, and it's really great. The Brood are out. There's this thing called the King Egg. What is that? It gets explained in here. It's a great idea. I really like all that stuff in here. The character moments, the big action-packed moments, some great Cree moments in here with the Accuser. I love the way Jonathan Hickman writes this stuff. X-Men number nine was a solid fire issue and one of the better issues of this series, which has had nothing but issues that I keep saying this is the best issue yet, which is awesome because that means it's just getting better and better and better and ramping up. But like I said, some major developments as far as the Brood go in here and also some major revelations on the Brood, their past, their history, and what exactly is this King Egg. Very excited about this one. It was really dope. X-Men number nine. Also from the world of X, we got uh, Wolverine number two. Wolverine number two, Benjamin Percy, Adam Kubert, I'm really liking this one. Issue two was pretty solid. Um, I loved issue number one, and I really liked the way that launched off this new run. Now, story-wise, it's kind of a similar Wolverine story that's been told a few times. 
So I'm willing to let it go and see what new spin Benjamin Percy will take on the story. I don't want to spoil what's going on in it, but if you're reading it, you know you've read Wolverine stories like this before. But the artwork by Adam Kubert is so good. The compositions, the layouts, everything about that. The texture, the etherealness of certain moments. I really did like it. There's this drug that's being made um, from Krakoan flowers. And of course, it's out there on the black market and people are ODing on it and stuff like that. So Wolverine's teaming up with this like detective or something to try to stop it. And he's also involved in some other crazy type stuff. The art's the big selling point for me on this one. Um, it does get into the character of Logan, but it doesn't in a kind of almost cliche way but i am very excited to see what percy's going to do because that backup story or the second story i should say in issue number one really means that this is going to go a little bit further than just um that that surface level um exploration of wolverine um anyway wolverine number two is out this week solid art in that one x-men fantastic four number three so the mutants want franklin the fantastic four don't want franklin uh, to leave, uh, you know, them, to leave the family. And then you got Dr. Doom kind of thrown in the middle. And this is real fun stuff. Doom does exactly what Doom should do in this. This is how you write Dr. Doom. I hate the current Dr. Doom book. I really hate that one. Victor's not acting like Victor. This is Victor. This is exactly what Doom would do. It's also exactly what Franklin and Reed and everybody else would do. Chip Zdarsky's doing such a great job. Um, the artwork by Do the Dotsons is pretty solid and decent, but Chip Zdarsky, his characterization of the Fantastic Four and the X-Men, it's great. There's some great moments in here, including a scene where Doom just comes at Xavier, and it's just great, and I love it. Chip Zdarsky needs to be writing Fantastic Four proper. Seriously. Only one more issue left of that one, but that one was super cool. Road to Empire. The Kree Scroll War is here, so Empire is looming on the horizon. Though the horizon may just be a little bit more distant than it was um, a couple days ago. But Road to Empire is basically a one-shot story that takes some of the characters from Robbie Thompson's Meet the Scroll story, and they it retells all the key moments from Marvel history that are going to factor into. The Empire story, which is the big Kree Scroll thing. So the Krees and the Scrolls have decided to unite under Hulkling as their new leader, and now they're coming to attack Earth. And this sets up all the previous stuff you need to know about, like the Celestial Madonna story and the Kree Scroll War and Captain Marvel and all that kind of stuff, right? So if you are getting into the idea of the Empire stuff and you want a little bit clearer of a vision of what has happened in the Marvel universe in the Marvel universe before to lead up to it, this is definitely something to check out. Um, the art's good in it. It's got great artwork, but I mean, it's okay. It's just retreading a lot of stuff. Speaking of retreads, Marvel's Snapshots Fantastic Four number one is here. It's a one-shot series of one-shots curated by Kurt Busiek. This one is written by Evan Doran and Sarah Dyer with artwork by Benjamin Dewey. Jordi Belair on the coloring. I really like this one. I really like the Submariner one before, and I really like this one. So what this is, is it's going to be exploring different facets of popular characters in the Marvel Universe from an ordinary person's perspective, right? And in this one, you got Dory returning. That's right. Dory was the Human Torch's first girlfriend back in the days and really factored in his Strange Tales appearances because he was like, he went solo before the thing did, right? Um, a lot of people don't necessarily remember that, but there's some weird, wild, zany, wacky type stuff of the Human Torch at Glenville High dating Dory. And so this is kind of his 10, this is his 10 year high school reunion. Um, the way they place it in Marvel, uh, the Marvel timeline is really cool because they do it through events that you can remember and familiar, familiarize yourself with from like the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but I really like this one. I thought it was great. A nice facet on the Human Torch. It's not so much a Fantastic Four story as it is a Human Torch Johnny Storm story, but it works and it works so well. The artwork is great. And Evan Dorkin and Dyer, they did an absolutely fantastic job with this one. I thought it would be kind of goofy and silly, but it's not. It was very touching and nuanced and it really hit the right moments of a Fantastic Four uh, fan's heart. And even bringing up some of the awkward oddball stuff from the Strange Tales Human Torch book. Fantastic stuff. I really like that one. I thought it was a great one shot. Immortal Hulk number 33 is here. It's extra size. It's got a few extra covers because it's technically issue 750. So this wraps up the whole other Hulk, what is it, Zinmu, his story, and the, and, and, uh, the Minotaur, Dario uh, Agar. It kind of wraps all this stuff up. Big, explosive, horrific type moments, some interesting developments, a wild ending that has me completely back on Immortal Hulk and super excited. I feel like maybe this story um, with Dario Agar and, and company kind of maybe, maybe went just a little bit too long and started losing people's interest, but if you lost interest in Immortal Hulk, 
read this book. It's crazy. This issue was nutso. It has some really great artwork by Joe Bennett, double page spreads, just grotesque and horrific in nature. And it was very, very effective. And I love how this story ended up. I love what it's done. I love how it's gear shifted and changed just a little bit. Um, I'm really falling back in love with Immortal Hulk. Issue number 33 and or 750 is out this week. Amazing Spider-Man 42 is here with probably Nick Spencer's best issue of Amazing Spider-Man yet. Because it focuses on this character, was it Gog? Yeah, it's Gog, right? Um, I don't really remember Gog, so if you remember Gog, good for you. If you don't, that's fine. This is the origin of Gog, and it's a really sad and tragic and, and nuanced and hopeful tale. I really liked this one. This was really fun. It's a great issue. It was touching. Amazing Spider-Man 42. Nick Spencer's been up and down. Some stories get dragged out. This one, I really, really liked. This was a solid, solid issue of Amazing Spider-Man. Like I said, the best one Nick Spencer's written yet, at least for me. Amazing Spider-Man 42, out this week. Force Works 2020. Why? Huh? Why can I not just stop reading this Iron Man 2020 stuff? Because I've always been obsessed with the character of Iron Man 2020, plus I read Force Works back in the day. Does this scratch my Force Works itch from the 90s? I don't know. Maybe. This is actually better than those comics, but, you know, those comics hold a special place in my heart. I love the characters that are in this book, but the story, the overall story is just kind of eh. But I love seeing Ultimo in this issue. Force Works 2020. Um, issue number two of three out this week. And now let's jump over to DC. From DC, we have Batman Curse of the White Knight, issue number eight. This is the final issue of Curse of the White Knight, and this is spectacular. A specific a spectacular and explosive finale. I absolutely love this. I love the direction, how it changes Bruce Wayne's character and what it does for him. The big final confrontation between him and Azrael. It was big. It was epic. Sean Murphy just killed this one. I loved it. I love this bit. Love this issue. Love this stuff. Keep loving it. <laughs> I love the way that Sean Murphy draws the cars and the Batmobiles and the action scenes and the cityscapes and everything like that. Um, his figure work sometimes is definitely stylistic, but I, I can dig on that because I love so much his backgrounds. And that's something I really want to highlight because you don't get a lot of artists who still put like a lot of detail and work into their backgrounds. Sean Murphy's one of those artists, especially with Matt Hollingsworth on the coloring. I loved it, and I loved the story. Like I said, it was big, and it was epic, and it was a finale worthy of the popularity and success of the White Knight franchise. This has been so much fun. Some of my favorite versions of Harley Quinn. Um, great takes on, on familiar villains, and you get to see the 89 Keaton Batmobile just tearing ass. And I loved it. Anyway, Batman Curse of the White Knight, number eight. That's the final issue of that. Detective Comics 1021 is here. The uh, Two-Face is seriously my favorite Batman villain. And I think Kev Walker draws a hell of a Two-Face. But I'm just not digging this story. I find it to be kind of muddy and confusing and just not interesting, at least for me. I love Two-Face, though. And it just doesn't have that richness and texture that I'm really expecting from a well done, delicately done Two-Face story. This one is a little, I don't know, it's okay, but it's just not, it's just not picking up on me. Detective Comics by Peter Tomasi to me is very up and down. So I don't know how I feel about this run overall right now, but it's not my favorite Batman title. And this was not my favorite issue of Tomasi's t Detective Run. Batman Superman number eight is here. I loved this issue. I thought it was great. So basically what you have in here is now that Kandor has been destroyed by Rogal Zar, you got uh, Zod who wants to resurrect Kandor using the Lazarus Pit. Well, that doesn't sound like a good idea. So of course it pits Batman and Superman against Ra's al Ghul and General Zod. Um, I loved it. I thought it was great. Nick Darrington on the, uh, the artwork fire. I love it. Please have more DC work for Darrington, please. I absolutely love his artwork, a very clean style that feels um, explosive and kinetic and charged when it needs to, and it also can be very uh, subtle at times as well. Really like this story. I thought this was a great wrap-up of it, um, and it sets up some interesting things to come. It, it has some touching moments. It has some explosive moments. I'm, I really like this story. I thought it was great, and I really appreciate a couple moments in here. In particular, Ra's al Ghul wears his mask that he, like, his action figure from the animated series had, and there's a moment where they kind of reverse the kneel before Zod line, and I really like that. In fact, I almost snapped a picture and shared it in the PCP Army, but I didn't want to spoil it for people. Batman Superman number 8, that's been a solid run so far by Joshua Williamson. Action Comics 1021. So Detective and, and, and Action are now on the same number again. Um, Action Comics 1021 wraps up this uh, big story about the, the Legion of Doom tearing up Metropolis and Leviathan shows up and 
it's dumb, you know, and it's rushed. John Romita artwork, you know, John Romita Jr., it's, I love this cat's artwork, but he's already a divisive artist, but when it's a rush job like this, or at least it feels like it is, it's just not clear. This has been the worst story that Bendis has written for Superman so far, has been this whole, like, Legion of Doom tie-in thing. Because first of all, it feels out of place. It feels outdated already, because this is referencing thing that's already happened. You're shoehorning in Leviathan to make me care about that. I don't care. I don't care about Leviathan. That stuff's so... D Ugh. Anyway, this run... The Action Comics run has had its moments, its high peaks. This has not been one of them. That's the lowest peak for me. I just did not like that story whatsoever. Flash is here yet again. Issue number 752, the fastest releasing comic book now. Um, it's about to slow up, though. Flash 752, continuing this uh, Flash... What's it called? The Flash Age story. I believe. Yeah, the Flash Age story. Um, basically, in this one, you got Barry um, finds out that there's like a, a Flash Heaven. You know, there's a Flash Museum. Why not a Flash Heaven? Um, but a little bit more about Paradox and what's going on. Joshua Williamson has been doing such a great job with the Flash ever since Rebirth started back when I first started doing my comic book reviews in 2016. Um, it's a very consistent, solid run, and this is yet another great issue. Really great artwork by Howard Porter. I just don't like how big he's drawn the the little things on Barry's ears, like, I, I don't know, they're, they're a little big and obnoxious, but there's also a really cool moment in here where they kind of give a nod to the Justice League movie Flash costume, and as much as I hate the Justice League movie, I really like that Flash costume. Anyway, Flash 752 is here, and it's awesome yet again. Justice League Dark 21 is here, and since, Justice League Dark's been a good book the entire time, and everything that James Tynion was setting up Rom V is now the writer, and he is continuing that, that tread. But he's making it better. In just two issues, I'm really liking it. Some really great moments here that harken back to some old-school Hellblazer, some old-school Swamp Thing type stuff. I really like the feel. Some great badass moments here, especially with Zatanna. Oh my goodness. You, you'll know what I'm talking about when you read it. The Queen scene. <sighs> Come on, how awesome was that? I'm really liking this book. I think it's great. It's really going to scratch that itch for your darker side of the DC universe. Um, if you like Constantine and Swamp Thing, if you like that old school 80s Vertigo stuff that was still not really Vertigo, because Vertigo wasn't quite a thing yet, but it was all still kind of tied into the DC universe. That's the feel that I'm getting, and Ron V's doing such a great job. The artwork, of course, by Martinez Bueno is absolutely fantastic. Like normal, Just League Dark, very excited to, for the direction of this story. The artwork, the layouts, everything. Great composition. Really cool, innovative type stuff going on. And it's a nice throwback to the, like, the late 80s of the darker DC Universe type stuff. Really liked it. Speaking of crazy stuff, From Beyond the Unknown. It's one of those 100-page giants. It's got some new stories in it. It's got some classic stories. So if you're going to be shut up for a while, if you're going to not be able to get new comic books for a while, pick up this, and it's fun because it's got some fun, strange, weird stories from Beyond the Unknown. From Wonder Comics, we have Amethyst issue number two. I'm going to buy and read an Amethyst comic book anytime it comes out because I'm obsessed with this character. I've loved this character when I was a kid. I, I found a few of these books, and I just have been fascinated with that character ever since. Um, but this runs okay. It runs okay. It's not going to... I don't think it's going to turn you into an Amethyst fan. In fact, I don't think there's a run of Amethyst that will turn you into a fan of, of her. Except for maybe the Sword and Sorcery one. The New 52 runs really good. Anyway, I love this character. I love the world, the everything of Gym World and the different factions and the gyms and all that stuff and their powers. And I'm really liking it. It's an interesting story, but it feels like because Amethyst doesn't ever really have a successful ongoing series, it feels like every time they redo it, we just get the same story. But there is some interesting twist that happens at the end of issue number two. Anyway, it's out. Issue number two of six. Basket Full of Heads is here with issue number six. Yes, six. The penultimate issue, one more issue left. This story has ramped up. And all the confusion about what this book was going to be about, like when you saw the first cover and you read the first issue, I'm like, I'm, I'm still kind of confused. What is this supposed to be about? Well, that's all clear now. You know exactly what's going on. Maybe we still got a few twists and turns in the final issue. Um, but I am loving this book. Joe Hill, Leo Max, and Dave Stewart. It's fun. Um, this is a big explainy issue, but even though there are a few pages where you just see that it's a big info dump and it's nothing but walls of text. But when you read it, the way that it's laid out with the artwork, it's very fascinating and you just breeze right through it. So that's really a tribute to Joe Hill and Leo Max and Dave Stewart and the editorial team and how they worked those scenes out because it really doesn't 
hinder the flow of the story. This book is fun. It's exciting. It's scary. It's funny. It's all those things in one. Hill House Comics from DC Black Label have been fire. Basketful of Heads is kind of the flagship book. It and a bunch of the others are fire. And Basketful of Heads has never failed to excite me, whether it's through the story, through the crazy concepts and ideas and, and activities that happen in the story, or the artwork and coloring. I really like it. I think this is a great book. Cannot wait for that final issue. Let's see what happens over at Vault Comics this week. We got No One's Rose, number one. It's a brand new one. This one is written by Zach Thompson and Emily Horn. Um, drawn by Alberto Albuquerque, Raul Angulo on the coloring, um, Hassan Osman El Hau on the lettering. I did an advanced review of this one already, and I really liked it. When I reread it today, I liked it even more. I thought it's great. So it's basically in the future, it's a post-apocalyptic thing, and instead of cyberpunk, they're calling it solar punk. So what happens is society collapses, you know, forests and trees all die out, and all this kind of crazy cataclysm. And now we're living in this world where they have learned how to genetically manipulate trees like instantaneously almost and they've grown this giant big tree and they live in this dome that's around this big uh, giant tree and the big giant tree um is like a super oxygenator and it keeps this like so there's only like 30,000 humans left alive or something like that and they're divided by a lower level and an upper level so of course you got the class war going on and 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 revolution and all that kind of stuff really cool I liked it because it's not it's it's almost so it's like it paints this almost like it's almost as if they've created this like utopia utopian bubble right that they live in but then you start seeing the cracks in that facade um and that's something that's typical in like a cyberpunk idea but the way to do it through greenery and vegetation so like all their technology and stuff for the most part is based on plants and it's just a really cool interesting idea um a very fresh take on an almost familiar concept but because it's such a fresh take on a different concept at the same time, it's definitely got its own voice and distinct uh, genre. It's solar punk, and I really like it. No One's Rose, number one. Check out my advanced review for a little bit more information about that. And, of course, we got a cool variant there and another variant there. So three covers for that one. Also from Vault this week, we have Heathen, number 10. I am so glad that I'm caught up completely on Heathen so I can read it as it continues on now because each issue is just a treat. Each issue is a part of a collective whole ongoing story, but each issue has its own identity. It has its own point. It has its own say. Heathen is absolutely fantastic. We got a new artist now, but it's still um, Natasha is still doing the writing, but the artwork is great. And even though it's different and not as gritty and it doesn't feel as textured um, as the first couple arcs, it really flows and it Feel, it fits the atmosphere and tone of the story as well. Of course, we still have um, Alterici doing the coloring, and that really helps. But I love the artwork in here. I love the story. It's subtle. It's uh, fantastical. Um, it's grounded. Um, I really like this. Heathen is absolutely fantastic. It took me so long to finally just commit to getting caught up on this book. But now that it's back and I'm caught up, I couldn't be happier. Heathen number 10 out this week from Vault Comics. From IDW, we have Transformers versus The Terminator number one. Look at that cover. The cover sold me. I love the cover. I'd buy this just for the cover. But I wouldn't buy it for the interior. I did not like this book. This book was dumb. I did not like it. It's a neat concept, I guess. So like somewhere in the future, once the machines have wiped out humanity, um, the Decepticons come and they start wiping out Skynet, right? So then they send the Terminator back in time to stop that to stop the Cybertronian threat from even happening, right? It's it's kind of the same idea of Terminator, right? Except for the machines go back to stop these other machines from being able to stop them, right? And of course, it's the Transformers. I don't know. It's okay. I didn't like the art. I didn't like the story. It was kind of sloppy. But that cover is pretty dope. Anyway, Transformers versus the Terminator. Um, I think that will please a lot of hardcore fans of those properties. Also from IDW, we have the Kill Lock number four. Um, I read issue number one, I thought it was pretty solid, but never read issues two or three until recently because when I was doing the uh, Best Comics of the Month live, uh, live stream, both, uh, well, Bueller, Bob, and Dylan, all three were like, you gotta read Kill Lock. So I picked them up again and I read them and I'm really liking it. And I'm glad I am. Issue number four was awesome. This story is great. For a story about four robots who are trapped in this Kill Lock, so they each are kind of sentenced to death or exile, but they have this thing called a Kill Lock. So if one of them dies, all the other ones die. Right? So if one dies, all four die. Um, but they're four different robots from four different classes and different different worlds and perspectives and views, and they're very much like people. And what's crazy is that even though this is a book about four robots, 
it's filled with humanity. It's really touching. It's really sad. It's really hopeful. And it's just such a well done book that's feel that's filled with rich meaning and depth and nuance. I really do like it. Um, Livio, Livio Romandelli, um, the writer and the artist. The artwork is awesome. It's beautiful. I'm so glad I gave this one another shot. Kill Lock. Wow. If you missed out on this one because I just wasn't covering it, I highly consider, I would highly consider to check out this book if you can find it because, yeah, I'm sorry. This book is awesome. That book is fantastic. Exo Man of War number one. We got a new Exo Man of War from Valiant Comics. Um, this is a pretty cool, fun first start, you know, into a new Exo Man of War book. And so Exo Man of War, he's like an old school, he's like a, I don't remember what tribe, he's a Visigoth or something like that, I think. Um, but he's like a, he's like a middle-aged guy, um, he's, maybe he is aged middle. Anyway, he's from the past, and he's got this crazy, awesome, extraterrestrial suit of armor, um, and he can, he, like, can, he can, uh, like, talk to it and stuff. I haven't been reading Exo Man of War in a while, um, but even not really knowing anything about the character, and I know a lot, because I did read the Vendetti stuff, and I read some of the old school stuff back in the day, um, but even if you didn't know anything, this is a fun place to jump on. If you've always wanted to check out Exo Man of War or Valiant, you know, this is something they're definitely going to get behind, because this is one of their flagship characters. Dennis Hallam is the writer of this one. The artwork's pretty solid. It's nothing that's going to super change your life, but it's a really solid debut of a comic book series, uh, superhero-wise. I never thought it was really, really solid. Exo Man of War number one from Valiant Comics is out this week. And from Image Comics, we got Crowded number 12, another fantastic issue. This is actually the final issue of the second arc. Um, I love it. I'm falling more and more in love with this story, with this world, with these ideas and concepts, with these characters, their relationship, the way they, 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 they the chemistry that they have. It's really fun. It's very Sam and Diane at times, um, but I absolutely love it. This book is great. Charlie and Vita, those are the characters instead of Sam and Diane. I'm going to start saying that Cheers just pulled a Vita and a Charlie. Anyway, Crowded is a great book that's dense and it's filled with a lot of stuff in it, but it flows right through the artwork, the lettering, everything is so top-notch in this book, including the design work and the writing, the characters' voices. I love it. And at the end of this, which is the end of the second arc, we are completely ready for a new direction, a new veer off into arc number three. Can't wait for it. It comes out later on this year. Crowded number 12, fantastic issue. On the stump number two, the second issue. The first issue was decent enough. Basically, it's like in Washington, Congress, when they want to get a bill passed, um, they wrestle. So they're wrestlers. So like Congress... The, you know, they're, they're wrestlers, the senators and the, the representatives, they're, they're wrestlers and they go out there on the stump and they, they literally battle it out. Um, the first issue was intriguing enough, but the second one just didn't do much for me. I do like the artwork and I like the brutal nature of the story, but it just started kind of getting a little bit clunky. And maybe I just wasn't remembering a lot from the first one, but I felt a little bit lost. So maybe during this hiatus, um, maybe I'll reread issues number one and two and then get ready for issue number three. Savage Bastards number two is from Mad Cave Studios. This second issue was way better than the first one. I thought the first one was okay. It's about this dude. I think he's immortal or something like that. And he just has a bunch of children. Some of them are bastards. Some of them are just regular people who don't even know who they are, and they, they hunt them down and try to kill them or something like that. But this story, in issue number two, was really good. The dialogue was great. The, uh, the coloring um, was really cool. There's a peyote tripping moment in here that was really neat. It's kind of psychedelic at times, but I, I thought issue number two was way better than issue number one. And issue number one was intriguing enough. I mean, I picked up issue number two, um, but I really got hooked into the story on this one. I'm starting to come around onto the characters and find them very interesting and compelling. And like I said, the dialogue is what really flows through this book and it's really solid and just such a treat. It's a Western from Mad Cave and I really like how Mad Cave is now branching out and doing a whole bunch of different types of stories apart from just their initial wave of more fantasy type fare. So Savage Bastards number two has my seal of approval. Well, that's what I read this week. There are some trade paperbacks that I had that I was going to show you. But where are they? I don't know. But once in future, the trade paperback is out this week and the New Mutants trade is out. So instead of just the Dawn of X trade paperbacks, if you've been trade waiting, the first one is out. It's New Mutants and it's collecting all the Jonathan Hickman New Mutants issues. So they were told kind of in a weird order, alternating with the Brisson one, but this will just collect the Hickman one. And what was the third trade paperback? I don't even remember. Is it right there? Hold on. Oh, yeah. It's Kanto. There's the once and future right there. There's the trade. And Kanto. Kanto will be coming back soon. Hopefully when comic books resume. But Kanto, if you missed out, this is one of my best... 
I thought this was one of the best comic books of last year. It's number 10 on my top 10. This book is fire, and it's nice that it's all in one handy collected edition. So there you go. Once in future, and Canto out in trade. So might as well pick up some trades if you can't pick up single issues next week, right? Anyway, thank you so much for your support and continuing to watch these videos and sharing and liking and all that stuff. And I promise you, we're not done here at PCP. We're going to keep on trucking through. And as soon as print comic books are back, as soon as comic books are released again, Maybe even if they just go straight digital. But as soon as comic books are released again, the weekly comic book review will returning. Will be returning. Anyway, tomorrow night I'm going live, 8 p.m. Central Time, to reveal my top 10 comic books of the week and rank them in an order. So let's chat tomorrow night about comic books. Thank you all so much for checking out the video and for subscribing and all that jazz. Please do join us at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. I've been Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.